Chi Miigwech for that beautiful introduction. It all sounds so great. And um, we have a slideshow here. It's just, just going to be mainly pictures as I do some storytelling. Um, and you'll you'll hear a little bit more about kind of the, the struggles and the excitement of um, my journey so far. So thank you for this space to share with everyone this morning. All righty. So I am just so you know, reading from a script. Um, so after about maybe 20 minutes, we'll have Q&A and I'm really excited to talk with everyone. All right. Um, next slide, please. Bonjour. That's hello in Ojibwe. I'm Danny Paradis, uh, Danny Paradis Indigenous Kaz, Makwa Nindo Dem, Onamani, uh, Zagiagan, and Dujaba. I am Bear Clan and I am from the Lake of the Sunset Glow, otherwise known as Lake Vermilion. And as Teresa said, I live on the Lake Vermilion Reservation, which is District 2 of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa in Northeastern Minnesota. I've been involved in some small grassroots food sovereignty projects, mostly helping with the planning processes so far. And it's my great privilege to be able to share stories around circular experiences in my journey to quote unquote bootstrap food systems changes and what's available to our people here. And not just what food options are available, but jobs, businesses, health and wellness, all under the food sovereignty movement. So bootstrapping is having to do much of the work on low budgets, many times working for no pay, out of pocket, while finding other means means to afford necessities like housing and transportation. And anyone who can resonate with this knows that the sacrifices are so worth it. It's been fretful and exciting finding new employment opportunities that give me flexibility. Um, I've taken on karaoke DJing on the weekends. I've helped my mom make and sell car seat covers with tribal patterns. I've beaded earrings and sold them. And I worked in nonprofit food access for a year and learned about local state and government food programs and what a blessing it was to have employment in the field I was passionate about. Next slide, please. So the food sovereignty movement is really just the fight simply put for sovereignty, which is self-determination. And what a cool thing it is to be human that we have such complex brains to make choices to cooperate and collaborate and determine shared meaningfulness in our lives. And that's really the center of the sharing today around six features that keep circling around and repeating themselves in my journey. These features are desperation, surrender, patience, love, trust, and resourcefulness. These have been interchangeable features that again, keep coming back around at critical points in the bootstrapping phase to teach me something new when I need to learn it. And for me, it's been helpful just to plug these moments into those boxes to remind myself that it's all part of the process, baby. So with that, let's get into it. Next slide, please. My start into food equity work was when my mom invited me, my sister Nikki, and her sister, my aunt Tracy, to incorporate her indoor aeroponic CSA farm idea into Harvest Nation. Being from an indigenous community and taking native studies classes during college, I'd heard the term tribal sovereignty and had ex some exposure to the phrase food sovereignty. So I started to study the food sovereignty movement and learned its four principles, which basically are local production and affordable access to culturally appropriate and healthy food, outreach and education, and using environmentally sound principles. That pillar of food sovereignty, that outreach and education was really hard for me to do without more of our people coming together. So a friend and a colleague of mine in Net Lake, Renika Love, approached me and we got to talking with Angela Dawson at 40 Acre Co-op. And together we were inspired to form the Boys Fort Food Sovereignty and Sustainable Agriculture Community Group, which gave us more flexibility to build out uh, more Boys Fort activities under the food sovereignty movement. This is where it goes into a deep dive uh, into that desperation feature. So um, kind of while all this was going along or in my start to food equity work, I was really desperate to become healthy and find my spirit again after I sobered up in mid-2017. I am an alcoholic. And by that time, I had already had two crash cars, four outpatient treatments, two inpatients, 
three DWIs, two stateside and one on the reservation. So a few months into quitting drinking, I offered to creator that, hey, any amount of pain and discomfort, discomfort I need to experience in order to grow back better, I'm okay with if it's for the greater good because I had been numbing so much. And all because so much had been invested in me that I felt obligated to do right by my peoples, which are all peoples, but I felt like I was too messed up in the head to be really of any good help to anyone. And as a single mother with two children and low income, uh, my kids, I just got to give them uh, kudos uh, that they have been the ones that have sacrificed so much, but at least they've had exposure to different ways of viewing life outside systems of privilege and excess. Next slide, please. So I had dedicated a lot of my life to Boys Fort community work because my grandma taught me so much love and life and being Ojibwe. I had written it on my application to a private high school on the East Coast and for my West Coast college application that I would work the Boys Fort. I remember interviewing for Harvard with this lady who met me in this fancy indoor squash court at my high school. She was clearly a rich and elegant lady and me, I was so rough around the edges and in fact, I still am so unrefined. She asked what I wanted to do with my life and I said I wanted to go to school to learn in the special Harvard's project on economic development in Indian country. And she asked me, she said, to do what? What are you going to do? I said I wanted to bring this quality of living, that fancy high school I went to, back to my reservation. And then it turned into a really awkward conversation when the lady tried to get me to be more specific, but I just looked around and said, like this, all of this. Why can these places have such good food, sports, caring community, field trips, and access to learning at such a large scale? And my reservation community, I felt, did not. This was maybe the point I wanted to make with her. So I guess I didn't exactly know what I was going to do, but that's why I wanted to study to see what I could help with. I didn't get in by the way. <laughs> um, I had to learn how to become patient in this journey, trying to find out what is going to work and what is my role and how can I help. I failed many, many more times than I've achieved success so far, but I'm still in it. And at certain points I've had my bubble burst. In the beginning of my adult life, I felt like the sky is the limit and it really is, but it's at with these odds that are so stacked against us, the people, that although while the change we need and wish to see in our lifetimes may not come to fruition totally, not just yet, but realizing like in a hundred years from now, you know what, that's plenty of time. I had a lot of hope for finding unique ways that could really just take off and make good change quickly and efficiently. And trying to learn more about gaps in the food system, I had a conversation with Andy Fisher who wrote a book called Big Hunger. And I think it's so cool that people who seem to be up on pedestals many times, you can just call and talk to directly. The book he wrote is about how the commodity food industry is responsible for turning emergency food programs into a whole economy of spreading a mass amount of overly processed foods to the people. I asked him if we could hack the USDA in favor of local food. And when I asked him, he laughed pretty hard and said, you know, it's been my life's work to get the USDA to change. And the closest he got, which is still a super big win, is the USDA's competitive grant called the Community Food Systems Program. So this big pill I had to swallow and surrender to the limitations we have because of how entrenched the status quo is. And that's what leveled me down to size from this big picture fantasy that the world can change overnight to, oh my God, is it even possible for us to live in harmony with food and each other once again? So I've also had to surrender not to the limitations of what is possible at large, but more so surrender to my own limitations, those things that make me ever so human. I have depression, anxiety, bipolar, borderline personality disorder, substance abuse disorder, binge eating disorder, all that fun stuff. Um, and through this, I've lost my sense of conscious connection and I've endured cognitive dysfunction. My brain just hasn't wanted to work like it used to. Felt like I've almost gone crazy a few times trying to keep my wits about me and my family's needs met. A lot of this uh, stemmed 
from in the last couple of years, I've been up bleeding open heart, not knowing how to grieve because a lot of my personal relationships that I've held dear have gotten really messed up. Next slide, please. My best friend had died in 2017 from mixing painkillers and booze. And it was a couple months later when I went to my last treatment. A year later, I had tried my hardest to keep my grandma at home, but it didn't work out with my family and she had to go to a nursing home and it's just been absolutely devastating. I had thought I found the love of my life in someone who was way too immature with, with me, but he had swept me off my feet unlike any other person before or since. And he had moved away and that was probably for the best. Uh, my friend, my best friend, my cousin, uh, she developed drug-induced schizophrenia and no matter how hard we tried, when she said she wanted help, could we get her stable for a couple of years? And her battle is still ongoing. Now back to the prayer to God, when I asked for correction, I had no idea the depths this kind of pain could go. And my heart goes out to anyone who may be in it now. The only under, understanding I have now, and I wouldn't change for the world, was learning how to really pray after purging a lot of stuff from the past and present. With all my gnashing of teeth and roaring at my helplessness, my lack of income, my lack of agency, I succumbed to eating really terribly for the comfort it brought. And when pandemic hit, my little family, me and my kids, ate so unhealthy, stopped exercising, and now they suffer bullying and fat jokes at school, and it's my fault, and I'm still so mad at myself. But honestly, I look back and there's really no other way we could have survived in the state that I was in. I used to be able to use my creativity and my brain power to outsmart my circumstances. And sadly, this was no longer available to me. I had lost my power. So my biggest point of surrender came when I wasn't sure if I could be of help, even in a volunteering role, let alone a regular job. I suffered paranoia and agoraphobia, meaning I didn't wanna leave the house. And I sat scared, reminding myself to breathe during Zooms. So I prayed. And I said to creator, you gave me a lot in life already. And I thought it was because you wanted me to help the world. But if it wasn't the case, then I would be okay just being a homebody and resign myself to a life that seemed less than worthy than all the investment in me. At this point, I lost all creativity. I used to love to write poetry and lyrics. I would jog and paint and all of that went away. My love of music drained and nothing, absolutely nothing felt joyous. I became more aware of my community's dying language and culture and growing up what felt like could last forever and with so many people I call traditional Anishinaabe as traditionabs, these strong, humble, giggling, wise and caring people, so many that were in my circle are gone. Next slide, please. Regardless, this all landed me to trust. I trust that whatever happens, everything will all be okay because I am just one person with lots of limitations. And maybe if I move out of the way, someone better will take my place. I did not like the words faith or hope because those were not things I could have. They were these pure lofty emotions I couldn't reach. But I can choose to trust and trust in fellow humans around me all doing good work and trust in the creator that the universe is mysteriously made and that things will continue on mysteriously for why I don't know, except that this realm that we are in was created simply because humanity at large is a very cool thing. Humans are cool. So I limp, limped along for a while and I took a year sabbatical from a couple board positions for more time for me and my kids. In a desperate prayer to my grandfather on the other side, I asked for help with coming up with an idea for another income source Couple months later, I had this idea of revitalizing Mazan tea, which is made from wild rice hulls that I remember my grandma had us kids try when I was a little girl. And so we started a family Mazan tea business. Next slide, please. So this helpless feeling is in the process of being healed by love and spirit, by love, which is spirit. Love is so important, and that's something I've always felt at Lake Vermilion, which is why I'm here, though I feel isolated working from home, bootstrapping our way through. This is where love connects to resourcefulness. Because I love my family and I love making them happy, I went to an elite college because education is a big deal. 
And while in college, I had two babies and their love helped me get the best grades of my life. I was going to drop out, then remembered seeing a picture of my great grandma working with a baby on her back. We've always worked with our children. So while in college, I learned to write a grant for a summer research program, which taught me how to gather information and make sense of it. I should have went to grad school so I could know how to work with the data quicker and do more. The greatest resources available to me have been prayer and other humans. My brain has changed in having purged my old ways of thinking and by the many different ways I've had to sit in despair to strengthen my ways of prayer practice. Through humans, our projects have found funding for community gardens, preserving Ojibwe knowledge, research funding, and stipends to stay afloat. Next slide, please. Grants have been an amazing resource to keep us uh, going and shout outs to funds shared by the Blandon Foundation and Honor the Earth. Unity, university professors and programs have been amazing also, which is how uh, I also can connect with um, Teresa through the RSDP and the Land Access Alliance. And of course, nonprofits like 100 Rural Women and the American Indian Community Housing, also known as ACO, who take care of us. And what it took for me was showing up my messy self time and again, knowing how much of a struggle living like this has been with the unhealthy consumption and socio-cultural loss in my community but it's definitely been necessary for me to keep trying, even if I feel like I'm the worst player on the team. I'm grateful to be humbled by the fact time and again, and to be surrounded by absolutely stellar humans that make me want to keep trying to be a better person and to those who allow me to be myself in all spaces. So with that, I say miigwech, bizindawie. That's all, and thank you for listening.